Coming up next on the Wet Fly Swing Podcast. We sat down one day to, to hash out how to describe the Big Hole River. And he closed his eyes and he said, for me, if you close your eyes and envision a Montana trout stream, the Big Hole River is what comes to mind, whether you've seen it or not. It's just that kind of classic sprawling valleys with wildflowers, you know, dwarfed under these big snowy peaks and grasshoppers falling in off the bank through the month of August. That was Wade Fallon describing the perfect Montana trout stream. Kevin Costner, the hopper box and the big hole today on The Swing. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how you doing today? Thanks for stopping by the show. Would love, love, love if you can share a past episode we've had, maybe this one, if you love it enough, uh, get a chance. This is our way of helping to grow the show, help another angler out there with their game, with all the content we have. We usually have an episode that can help just about everyone around the country. Thanks in advance if you've had a chance to share one of these episodes. Today's episode is sponsored by Chota Outdoor, legendary comfort and equipment you can trust. Chota insists on the finest materials and craftsmanship you can assure you have the highest standards of quality. You'll feel in control of the elements in your Chota gear. Every product is solidly backed with a no-nonsense warranty against defects. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash Chota right now. That's Chota, C-H-O-T-A, to support this podcast and the Chota Outdoor family right now. Today's episode is sponsored by Togan's Fly Shop, who provides superior quality products at an affordable price. An amazing resource for fly tying materials, tools, and fishing accessories. Since 2005, Togan's has been over delivering on price, service, and passion. And now you can check out that Togan's buzz for yourself. Right now, you can head over to wetflyswing.com slash Togan's to get started. That's T-O-G-E-N-S. You support this podcast by clicking through that link to Togan's online. Wade Fallon is here to take us into one of the most well-known trout streams in Montana. We find out which hatch is Wade's favorite throughout the year. It coincides with, uh, with Mother's Day. And we also uh, find out which big-name celebrities are doing shows as we speak nearby not too far away from uh, Wade's operation there. And we also find out uh, about some of the struggles with pressure as as everything grows. Uh, Wade's definitely seen some things there. He's got a couple of uh, tips on that as well, and he's talked about this in the past. So this is pretty pretty good stuff. For me, it's another bucket list Montana stream. So, uh, so let's check it off the virtual list today. So without further ado, here we go. Wade Felon from BigHoleLodge.com. How you doing, Wade? Hey, Dave, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, thanks for coming in here. We actually had a recent episode. Um, we talked a little bit about, not as much as we're going to go into depth today, but we had Frontier Anglers on uh, oh, cool. recently. Yeah, and we chatted, and I know they're up in your neck of the woods. And you're kind of in a hot spot, you know, Montana, you know, that whole part of the region. You're kind of in the busy. Does it feel like you guys are in one of the, one of the busiest, hottest, kind of the big name spots from around the country? It does feel that way, uh, increasingly so with uh, this onslaught of TV shows. It seems like Taylor Sheridan down in Texas found Montana, and we've got Kevin Costner. We've actually got uh, Harrison Ford here in Butte, just north of the lodge, filming another show. And then I think they got a another show coming after that. So the southwest corner of Montana has become the, I don't know, the Patagonia Argentina of and I guess it always has been that way, but it definitely since COVID seems like there's a bit more focus on social media on this neck of the woods. Yeah, there is. It's kind of interesting because it's always been on my radar. I've spent quite a bit of time in that part of the state, but you know, the things have changed too with fly fishing. There's tons of other additional areas now people are going to around the country and around the world. So it's pretty interesting. And then Harrison Ford and um, Costner, I mean, those guys are obviously fly fishermen, are they actually, I haven't heard about these films. Have you heard about like the details or the names of those films? So Yellowstone is the one Kevin Costner is doing. And he bought a ranch over on the Bitterroot, I'm told. And I know he's a fly fisherman. Um, in fact, my father-in-law guided for 35 years over in the Bozeman uh, Big Sky area and guided Costner at one time. And I guess he's a pretty good angler. Hmm. Um, not sure about Harrison Ford. 
their film in 1923, the prequel to Yellowstone, which goes back to kind of the the up and coming of Butte. And I haven't seen either of these shows, so I'm I'm probably not the one to speak on that. But I know that it's winning awards for cinematography, and it's just gorgeous. We, on our guide trips, often drive by the set, and I've got cousins up in the upper Big Hole Valley that have been on the show riding horses, and it seems neat. It seems like they're they're really sticking to, you know, they're staying loyal to what it was like in Montana. Yeah. Right. Because things have changed a little bit too, right? Because we talk about Montana is still this huge area, but you do see some of these cities and towns, right? That have grown a lot. Are you seeing that? In, well, I guess that's, I think that we talked about that on that last episode that you don't see it as much in your area because you're kind of a specific destination, but you see it around Montana. We do. Bozeman in particular, um, also up in Whitefish, but Bozeman really, it's always been the gateway to Yellowstone National Park and a quick drive up through Big Sky and into West Yellowstone, and then people access the park. So Bozeman is growing. And I, as I'll get into with the the lodge, I split my year between summer seasons up at the lodge in Wise River, Montana, which is still the middle of nowhere, and, uh, and then school years and off season in Bozeman while I was growing up. And driving back there now, it's, you know, I mean, it's not all bad. There are incredible restaurants and really neat people. And, but I think it's growing quicker than the traffic yeah. organization can catch up. <laughs> right. with. And I work for a water quality advocacy group out of Bozeman and, and we're working quickly to try and match the urban sprawl before it affects rivers like the Gallatin and, and the Missouri and the Madison further. It's already affected them quite a bit coming out of big sky. Just, you know, the state department of environmental quality couldn't quite keep up with what was needed to be done as this building boom started and then COVID really expedited. Yeah. But what I think that will do, and I think what it is doing is it's moving a lot of native Montanans out of inner Bozeman, just cost of living, moving out to Livingston, over to Butte. So it's changing rather quickly. And the fisheries, well, the Madison's a great example. There are so many fish in the Madison, so many big fish in the Madison, and you get people floating down the Madison saying, I never got a fish on a dry fly. Well, changing the way we fish these rivers to get fish on a dry fly is necessary, and I think these fish are, are smart enough to start going nocturnal or at least start eating at early and late hours of the day, and a lot of fish can be caught under a dry on a little nymph, but if you're like me and my father especially, you want to see a fish come up on a dry, you want to work a rising fish. And that opportunity hasn't disappeared. It's just changed. No longer can you put a boat in at 10 a.m. and float to 4 p.m. and just flop a single dry down the center channel. You've got to be a little bit stealthier and plan your day around these new visitors. And I think with COVID lifting, hopefully, knock on wood, as flu season rages, um, a lot of folks that didn't go abroad, didn't go to Chile and Argentina, didn't go to New Zealand, they're going to start traveling internationally again, and there will be a little bit of pressure alleviated on these rivers. Yeah. Do you find that with what you have going there? Because you can look around the country, right, and you can see these places like the Grand Canyon, Middle Fork, the Sam, some of these places that are pretty, right, they would be really busy, but they put limitations by doing like a lottery system. Do you see the big hole and places like that, like that might be something in the future or is that already there? It's not there and it's a hot topic. The Madison River has kind of thrown into the forefront. You know, it's a glance into the future of planning for Montana's rivers. The Smith River, which flows from White Sulphur Springs to about Great Falls, is a gorgeous, gorgeous little river. It's about a 50, 58 mile, 59 mile stretch from put in to take out. So you've got to camp uh, at least two and up to, I think they allow you five days on that river, but it just can't handle the pressure. So they put it on a lottery system and it's, I used to always draw a permit and have been down several times. And lately it's been hard to, hard to find a permit in my friend group. But what it's doing is it's keeping the Smith intact. Exactly. And the Madison river, because it's so close to Bozeman and so close to Yellowstone and has a couple of dams, so it, it tends to have more water. It has a lot of traffic. And 
there's this guide versus, you know, Joe public fight going on and and the numbers are coming out about how many guides are on the river and how many, you know, just off the road, park your truck and go or new boat owners are on that river. And I don't know how, I'm glad I'm not involved or in charge of anything over there on that, but what they decide there will definitely affect the big hole and the beaver head and the Missouri. But what they come up with, I think will be the blueprint for rivers like the Yellowstone and the Missouri, some of these higher trafficked, more water rivers. Yeah. And a lottery has come up, comes up at the dinner table at the lodge. We take eight to 10 guests and either dad or I host dinner each night. And that's been a topic of debate the last few seasons is how does this shake out in the future? Because Montana is so climate safe, uh, generally crime safe and a lot of people are are moving here, it seems. So how are we going to handle crowding on our natural resources? And I, I think a lottery system is not such a bad idea, but how do you do that? Right now, our elk license for an out-of-stater is about $1,000. Right. For an in-stater, it's $26. Yeah. So I think before we go to some sort of lottery, we could look into where this licensing money is going specifically and we can probably bump up the resident license from $26 a few bucks and put that money toward better data collection on these rivers of who is where. And a lot of these crowding issues are perceived issues because there are few access points. So when everyone's at the same boat ramp at the same time, it seems really crowded. But then as soon as you get out on the river and kind of spread out, you don't see nearly as many boats Right. What's that look like on the, uh, if you come up to one of your spots there and it's, a, uh, you know, we were actually just in Ohio, you know, we did a steelhead alley trip and I, I had never been there and we rolled up. To, I think it was the first day. Yeah. It was the first day we were like on ahead of crew there. Um, it was like a hosted trip and, uh, we rolled up to the first spot and there was like 15 cars, <laughs> you know, and our Jeff, you know, our guide was like, wow. Okay. This is, I've never seen this before, right? So, I mean, they think this has happened all over the country, but for you guys, what does that look like? You know, 10 boats there, or is there more than that? Depends on the season. So the big hole in particular, I guess I'll back up here. So my mom and dad started Big Hole Lodge in 1984. And when they did, uh, my mom grew up in Montana and dad grew up out in Pennsylvania and found Montana in the seventies. And made his way to Aspen, worked on mountain rescue. And my mom made her way to Aspen through the ski industry. And they met and dad managed a fly shop called Father Gills uh, on the Roaring Fork and the Frying Pan. And Chuck Father Gill was the one that talked the two of them into, you know, a lodge model. They said, no one is really doing that. And at that time, you know, it was Lonnie Allen's Three Rivers Ranch and Phil Wright's Complete Fly Fisher and maybe a couple others throughout the West, but dad went on the road, drove through Idaho, Wyoming and Montana and looked for somewhere that had proximity to a lot of good fishing and found a realtor in Dillon, Montana, who said there's a 10 acre parcel up on the Wise River surrounded by national forest. You're 45 minutes to the beaver head, 15 minutes to the big hole, an hour to the Clark Fork, <laughs> hour and a half to the Bitterroot. Wow. There are a handful of spring creeks in the valleys that you can get to quickly. And dad went up and pretty much bought it, <laughs> drove back to Aspen and told mom what he'd done. I'm just curious on this. What did he pay for that thing? Do you have any idea back? This was in like the early 80s? This was 83. And you know, I sure don't know, but I'm sure it was a little different than it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. It was like $10,000, right? Or something like that. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. There was one building on the property. Oh, wow. An old 70s looking single floor, two bedroom, one bath with a kitchen and a living room. And so when they started the lodge, mom and dad had a bedroom and the client or clients shared a bedroom. And then dad guided and mom cooked. And then when huh. I was born in 88, uh, they had to remodel another bedroom and amazing crying baby didn't work with the clients. So they built another cabin and that's kind of how the lodge grew to what it is now. Ah. And actually, it, our first clients were the writer Tom McGuane and his son Thomas. Oh, wow. 
and they slept in that scenario across the hallway from my mom and dad. And <laughs> crazy, they came back about five years in a row. And Tom wrote a nice article in New York Times and got the lodge off and running. But oh wow! So the big hole is one of our bread and butter options, being so close and being the incredible river it is. But it's undammed, so it's a freestone river that loses flow all year long. And I would say most boat owners in Southwest Montana own drift boats. They're a little bit easier to maneuver with gear and people and a little cleaner for fly line. And they hold up a little better if you do mess up, assuming you keep her straight. So some have rafts and some have both, but we find on the big hole that by about a thousand CFS, cubic feet per second of flow, hard boat no longer works on that river. So Yes, if you come for salmon fly hatch in the middle of June on the Big Hole River, you're going to be appalled with how many vehicles are in the parking lot. But again, there's enough water once you get out on the river. If you know I'm either going to hold the brakes today and tuck in or I'm going to just motor and do a huge float and get away from people, you can have that wilderness experience even at the height of crowding. But after July 4th, it gets pretty skinny on that river and you've got to know the road or you're going to have your raft hung up a lot. And this is a ranching economy and community in addition to a outdoor tourism economy. And um, both of those operate, you know, fairly respectfully of each other when they're working together. So we're pushing big time for more monitoring of water temperature and dissolved oxygen because right now everything is flow based. And the, the Montana system of water rights is set up such that water rights are like property rights. They run adjacent to the land. And if you've bought a 30,000 acre ranch or, you know, generationally bought into it, then you have the legal right to use that water for, for your cattle. And on a losing river like the Big Hole, it becomes pretty tenuous come mid-August. But Right now, there are organizations like the Big Hole Watershed Committee and the Big Hole River Foundation and the Grayling Recovery Project, and everyone's talking about water all summer long, and there are a lot of ranches. Uh, J.M. Peck runs a ranch out of Melrose, and there are some ranchers that are really forward-thinking, using technologies and infrared cameras to see where grass is doing great, doesn't need water, and where grass is a little yellower than you'd like it, and that needs some targeted irrigation at night. Some amazing things can be done, but again, just like getting ahead of the urban development and urban sprawl, we really need to get ahead of water resource management. That's right. Yeah, we just had an episode. Uh, Darren uh, Calhoun with the Wind River Reservation went into the water rights, right? That's a huge issue up there for them. And really interesting story about the, I mean, it is when you go back to it, really water, right? It is the uh, water wars, right? It's always going to be the thing because especially as we're in this kind of a climate change, right? We've had some droughts and things like that. It, it makes, you see it even more, right? It's in the forefront. Yeah. It's good to hear you guys are taking the lead on that. We love this business and the last thing we want to do is have to get out of it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's why the fly fishing thing is so, you know, just just a cool, you know, I think most of the people are thinking like that, right? They understand like, hey, yeah, this is not only is it good for the fish, but it's good for the environment, the conservation. It's all part of the package. Well, let's dig into a little bit. And we've got a lot, you know, there's obviously a lot of topics we could dig into here, like Montana, you know, the even getting into the water, the law of about right, like private property, that's an interesting topic as well. But if we have time, we'll circle back around on that. But let's dig into a little bit on, you know, let's just say if we got a group coming, I think your lodge has eight people, right? That's kind of what you guys run there at the show per week. Correct. Yeah. So if you had a group of eight people coming in and say, I mean, when does your season start? Is it kind of starting in like the uh, May through October sort of deal? Yes. So we opened May 7th this year, although willing to open earlier, uh, we operate on a six night, five day package. So the area fly shops are open when ice comes off, usually around mid April. We have a squala hatch on the big hole river. The Bitterroot as well has a squala hatch, which is the smaller stone fly. So you've got the numeras and then the squalas and then the yellow sallies, then the golden stones, then the great big salmon flies. So the squala hatch fishes similarly in that it's kind of the first big meal the fish have seen all winter. 
and uh, they're dark, but they're leggy and you can throw little sofa pillow, little micro chubbies. And uh, we would love to be open then. It's just hard to talk someone from out of state into flying in when it could snow for five days in a row. Oh, right. Yeah. Whereas day trips, I think the fly shops do pretty well with a, hey, the weather window opened up for tomorrow. Let's hit it. So May 7th, we've determined is about when Mother's Day caddis hatch starts pretty true to the date. And uh, we love to dry fly fish. So when the dry fly fishing has finally opened up for the year, uh, we're open and then we stay open right through September 30th. We used to stay open till October 15th, but as we can get into here in a bit, brown trout issues have have resulted in FWP considering closing these rivers on October 1st. And after several meetings with FWP and their biologists, Big Hole Lodge has determined that's a good idea and we're going to start just getting off the river when the brown trout go into spawning. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, so you have that season. So it's your typical, yeah, May through September and then... And then October through the rest of the winter time, what are you up to? What are you guys doing during that period? Well, I used to sit and listen to folks ask my dad, what do you do all winter? And <laughs> I wondered too, uh, he's a retired Marine and oh, wow. out of bed at 5.30 onto the floor for his push-ups, and then Wall Street Journal and then a walk with the dog and then office work. And he's very structured. And I, you know, I was off in school and out in Pennsylvania and then grad school in Missoula. And I never saw his day to day other than when we were together on weekends or whatever. And now that I'm in that role, dad's 75 and in semi-retirement and I'm running the show on the back end here. And it's amazing how much, you know, just picking up the phone and talking fishing and pulling up the calendar and sending the deposit requests and the invoices and the state reports for where people went the summer before. And but I mean, I won't make it sound like I'm I'm working a nine to five here. I have a nice, we call it our hibernation. A good friend of mine, uh, Hillary Hutchison, calls it our hibernation season. Just like the bears, we crawl in and ski a lot and work when the sun goes down, which it does early. I mean, I don't know what it does in your neck of the woods, but by four o'clock here, it's pretty much getting nighttime. Yeah. That's right. So that's cool to hear. So yeah, and you guys probably deserve it because I'm sure between May and October, you're probably working more than an eight-hour day, right? <laughs> There's not a day off from May 7 to October 1. And often those days, it gets light at 5 a.m. and it's dark at 10, 10.30. And uh, some of our best conversations around the dinner table go long past 10.30. So they're long days, but uh, I love it. And I guide. Um, oh, you do? Cool. Yeah, I Dad always, I don't know how he did it. My mom and dad uh, split when I was two. So dad ran the show alone for the last 30 years. And he guided five days a week and ran the business and hosted dinner and did the right. airport shuttles on the weekends. And Jeez. I'm doing three days a week on the water and then have two days to catch up in the office. And I've got a little photography company. So on, on one of those days, I go out and shoot film for our social media and YouTube and marketing and, and whatnot. Today's episode is sponsored by Drifthook, who has pre-packed fly assortments for every stage of your fly fishing journey. Each kit is organized by species and includes instructional videos and easy-to-follow guides. Their fly shop quality flies are hand-tied and inspected before being carefully packed into their durable, double-sided, water-resistant fly boxes. I've got one of those boxes right here, the Drift Hook Streamer Surge, and it is super, uh, super clean. It's packed uh, with everything you need. Flies are well made. It's got a, a row of some beads. It's got a row of uh, some rabbit strips. It's got a little bit of flash there. As I flip it over on the other side, it's packed with some smaller flies. It's got some muddlers and, uh, and it fits right there. Double sided box, nice and clean. They have everything from nymphing to dry flies, streamers to Euro nymphs, and everything in between. Uh, if you're brand new to it or know somebody who wants to get into fly fishing or needs a good present, uh, this is a great opportunity. Uh, I would love to get this thing in my stocking, I can tell you that much. You can check out Drifthook right now by heading over to drifthook.com and using SWING at checkout to receive 15% off your next order. 
That's Drifthook, D-R-I-F-T-H-O-O-K dot com. Drifthook dot com and use Swing, S-W-I-N-G at checkout to get 15% off your next order and some of these sweet custom fly patterns. Okay, back to the show. They made him different back then. I think that's the take home is that it looks like your dad was a Marine, right? I mean... And they didn't have email or computers. I mean, this was all right <laughs> for some things was better. Did you ever think about, you know, becoming a Marine going into the armed forces? You know, I didn't, I often think of it now, you know, my grandfather fought in world war two in the Navy and lost his leg. And my dad, as soon as Vietnam started heating up at 17 years old, volunteered for the Marines and his younger brother, uh, went in the special forces with the army and. I respect so much everyone who chooses to serve this country. And at the same time, I'm, I'm so worried about, you know, the button pushing and how quickly lives can be lost with technology now. And I don't think that's a good reason not to join. I just, I never did. Yeah, no, I think, uh, and we actually had an episode recently with Bo Beasley. He's actually writing a book about Project Healing Waters. I think it's oh, like wow. 40 stories of you know, veterans, right? These stories. And I've had a few on the podcast. Joe Jackson was on recently and talked about, you know, you know, just the PTSD, right? It's this powerful thing. But Bo, yeah, it was a very emotional episode because he talked a lot about the struggles there with some of these people. And um, yeah. anyways, me too, right? I mean, I never went into the armed forces, but I appreciate the sacrifices that these people yeah. make. So, and I hear you too. I was always, I'm maybe like you, like the next generation, you know, my, you know, your friends or I have a friend that jokes sometimes about the millennials, right? Being the whatever lazy or something. But I was, I feel like I'm kind of wimpy compared to the old guys. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like they did a lot, you know, all that stuff, right? I don't know. Is that because you kind of grew up in a period where there wasn't a lot of wars. I mean, I guess there was Afghanistan, right? But it wasn't the same. Yeah. I remember sitting in my freshman year science class when we went into Baghdad and, uh, you know, September 11th, I was eighth grade. Oh, wow. So it's been there for sure. And then also, you know, I had a lot of friends in high school that went and watched them come back. And yeah, I mean, whew. you saw the effects on the big hole. There's a healing uh, facility. It's called Freedom Ranch. And my dad volunteers there on Wednesday nights. I think it's about 14 wounded warriors from any war. Uh, it's not time specific. Uh, so all different age groups come out for a like a four night, three day healing clinic, which involves fishing and learning to fish. And some folks have fished all their life and some have never held a fly rod. So my dad goes down on Wednesday nights and teaches fly casting and oh, nice. Otz Kilcher, another Marine from Alaska, TV show fame. His daughter is Jewel, the singer. Oh, wow. Uh, he joins dad and the two of them have become really good friends. And I think as a team talking to these men about men and women about the healing that fly fishing and the outdoors have unlocked for them is really, really helpful. And in fact, back to Tom McGuane, Tom McGuane did a speaker series recently at Montana State University about wounded warriors and fly fishing. And he did three vignettes about folks that had found healing through, through fly fishing. And one of them was on my dad and what he endured in Vietnam and what he got back to and how finally finding the serenity of sitting on a riverbank, watching a feeding fish and picking your fish rather than just splashing into the river. And I listened to that when it came out and then not until just a couple of weeks ago, for whatever reason, I was out in Wise River. My wife was on call and not home. And I had the house to myself, built a fire and put on Band of Brothers. I'd never watched it before. And binge watched like the whole 10 episode thing. And one of the scenes involved the commander, I guess, discussing if I make it out alive, I'm going to find somewhere back in the States remote near a river and live my life quietly. And that hit me like a ton of bricks. That's exactly what my father has done. Oh, right. Right. That's what he did. Yeah. Gosh, I was like, that brings goosebumps to you, to your body for sure. Yeah, there's so many examples of that. Well, this is, um, and again, like I said, we're going to be doing a little tribute, uh, you know, coming up here as we approach 400 episodes as well. To, wow, that's really neat. You know, everybody, Project Healing Waters. So we're excited about that. 400, good for you. Yeah, yeah, we've been <laughs> we've been doubling down the last couple of years. So we're doing 
a lot of content, which is a lot of fun because it gives me opportunity to talk to more people. And that's always a good thing. Well, let's go back into, you know, the rivers as we're digging in. So we got a bunch of rivers here, not only the big hole, but, and I want to focus a little bit on dry fly fishing because, you know, for a lot of us, including myself, that is a struggle, you know, not only the tying of the dry flies, but the matching of the hatch. What does that look like when, if you have a crew of, you know, people coming in there, let's just say, you know, could be right anytime in the summer, July, August, what are you telling them to prepare for? Do you give them like a hatch chart and say, okay, this is what we're going to be looking for? Or is there a lot of variation throughout the year? We do give a hatch chart. It's on our website under the fly fishing tab. My dad built a hatch chart back in the day. And before I dive in here, I would say that just like the millennial versus greatest generation, there is a, a laziness in fly fishing these days. Yeah. Where back, you know, the Al Troths and the so many names are coming to mind. My dad, I mean, you'd sit and you'd match the hatch. And if it wasn't a Wits hopper, it, it'd have to be a, you know, you'd have to really trim it up and splay it out and then throw it on. And okay, they ate that. Whereas today, it seems like too many boats are just throwing a sofa pillow with a Pertagon nymph under it and right purple haze. And, you know, I, I can't knock it. I do it too. It's a great fly. The sofa pillow imitates several different things. It holds a nymph well. But yeah, we're losing that, you know, what size mahogany done is coming off right now. And is that blue winged olive olive enough? And <laughs> uh, should I get out a marker? And it's really fun to encounter. And we're really lucky to have a guide staff that does it. And, you know, Travis Thompson, you dig in his guide bag and he's got like a, a high school school girl's coloring set oh, right <laughs> for all their different notes i mean my wife madeline takes notes like that she's got a color for every topic and travis has markers for every scenario and if he doesn't like the look of somebody's fly from the underside then he'll paint it and throw it out there and it's successful and fun to fun to fish that way yeah and really guiding we're fishing vicariously through you so how guides operate in the boat is kind of setting the pace for our clients and if you just tie it on in the morning before you meet the clients and then never let them look at the fly and tell them at the end of the day they had a great day it's you know that's not what it should be about yeah right it's about giving them uh you know, like we learned on this recent trip, you know, it's like giving your clients the tools to not only have success on your river, but go take it back home, right? And have success because they've learned something more than just, right, how to catch a fish. It's more deeper. Is that kind of how you guys look at it? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And recognizing that, you know, I, I don't want to misquote the numbers, but guiding in Montana is something like 13% of the crowding on the rivers. So recognizing and embracing that the greatest ambassadors for the river are the guides that are on it every day. And we have a great opportunity to teach the masses of new crowding that everyone likes to complain about how to kind of be on the water, you know, stay out of the gravels and stay up on the bank a little longer. And when you walk into the river, don't walk right on the bank, mowing down that nice cover where all the bugs can live and fall in. All sorts of these things are teaching opportunities that can be done in a non-confrontational way. And kind of a lead by example. Mm -hmm. Nice. Well, and you guys have more than, you've got a few rivers. So if we were coming in there, or somebody was coming into that area, you've got the big hole. And what are the other rivers? Just walk us through some of those that you'd be fishing in. Yeah. So it's, it's hard. <laughs> I understand that people can't take five full days off of work to come out and fish. So we have a lot of requests for like a three night, two day. And boy, that's putting a lot of pressure on you as an angler and the river and the weather, but also it's so hard as a manager to try and figure out, you know, do I send these people to the big hole today or the upper big hole, which is a different river altogether than the lower big hole, uh, which is altogether different than the middle big hole, which is a canyon stretch. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a 155 mile river from wow. its origin down to the confluence with the Beaverhead and the Ruby and the Big Hole come together to form the Jefferson. So right over the uh, the mountains from us is the Beaverhead River. And that too is really two different rivers. There's the dam stretch up above Barrett's Diversion that, you know, it's, it's incredible. Big fish, tons of them, and a lot of crowding as a result because it's right off the freeway and 
coming up I-15 from Utah and Idaho. It's the first water you really see. So a lot of folks stop and wade fish, but it doesn't seem to bother the fish on a nymph. And then you get down below Barrett's diversion and the river really meanders out. There's not really public access anywhere. You've got to get in a boat and go through ranch land and dry fly fishing down there is quite good. And not that it's not quite good up above during a hatch like the pale morning duns or the blue winged olives or the crane flies, you know, you can get really good dry fly fishing up above, but you see a lot of good nymph fishermen doing really well up above. And then we lease a ranch, um, have since the eighties in that lower stretch. So two days a week, we're able to wade fish down there on that lower beaver head. And, uh, I guide there one day a week and I really prefer taking new clients and teaching on that stretch of river because you can get up somewhere and hide and watch, you know, set the rod down and, and watch how fish are feeding and, and what hmm. stage of the hatch are they keyed into, uh, go kick bushes around and see trichos come up out of the grass and then explain that these hatched yesterday and they're going to get up here as soon as the dew gets off their wings and mate, and then they're going to come back down to the water. And for a new <laughs> fisher, man or woman, it's invaluable to be that, you know, connected with what's going on in a river. And then get in a boat the next day on a river like the Bitterroot, which is an hour and a half uh, from the lodge, but all dry fly fishing. It's it's a cutthroat fishery and it's fast water and you're in a raft. It's kind of spicy rowing, but you get the fly down on the water and these cutthroat in that clear water are very eager to come up from the deep and eat. So you get to watch the take. These are West Slope cutties? Yes. Yeah, that's right. Wow. So, and then the big hole, I mean, it's the, uh, the browns, right? You have some pretty big browns in those rivers. We do. So the Big Hole River is the last river in the lower 48 with all five species uh, being grayling and cutthroat, the native species, and whitefish, mountain whitefish. I know they get a bad rap, but I don't understand why. They're trying to eat too, and they fight great. So those three are our natives. And then, of course, we brought in brook trout, rainbows, and brown trout. And the guy who designed our website has become a, a dear friend fishing buddy and hunting buddy and football trash talker. And uh, <laughs> he was a writer and came out to Montana from uh, Colby College and worked with Off the Beaten Path and, you know, did a lot of the writing on our, our website. And we sat down one day to, to hash out how to describe the Big Hole River. And he closed his eyes and he said, for me, if you close your eyes and envision a Montana trout stream, the Big Hole River is what comes to mind. Hmm. whether you've seen it or not. It's just that kind of classic sprawling valleys with wildflowers, you know, dwarfed under these big snowy peaks and uh, grasshoppers falling in off the bank through the month of August. And it's just classic, real dark bottom, kind of a tannic colored water. Although if you were to draw a glass of it and look, it looks pretty clear. Huh. All packed together in a thousand CFS or more, it, it looks black and that gives a really, really cool feel and contrast to the green valley and the white mountains and the blue sky. But then because of all those tannins and nutrients, it's a very phosphorus rich rock bed uh, throughout the Big Hole Valley. You get a lot of bug life and a lot of, you know, worm and different aquatic life throughout the river that supports big fish. Right. So it's just got a lot of food. A lot of food, a lot of food. Yeah. And these browns get like, how big might you see a, what would be a big brown or, an, and then an average brown? Oh boy. Every year you hear of the big one and it seems to be that, you know, high water window when the fish have wintered all winter and somewhere safe. And all of a sudden the river starts coming up and they know that they can't hold where they wintered and they start moving and all the little fish have to get against the bank to stay out of the main flow. And you get these absolute alligators <laughs> tucking in on the bank and eating those. Oh wow! And uh, for the dedicated streamer fisher, it's incredible. Right. But you still see those fish, you know, more rarely throughout the summer. You've got to work pretty stealthily and work harder to get them on a dry fly, but it's doable. You know, I don't want to 
quote a number yeah. and then have everyone come out here expecting this, but I, I will tell a story after fishing 30 years on this river myself and uh, never seeing a fish like this, a friend of mine who guided for us a bit before moving to Norway and starting a lodge, his name is John Bond. He invented a fly now carried by Umqua and, uh, he came up and literally did the live in a van by the river thing on the big hole near my house. And he was tying in his van and we'd go out and fish and trade off. And I said, this thing looks like a Christmas ornament. This isn't going to catch any fish. And he said, just trust it. Well, sure enough, I caught a 24 inch brown. So next day my wife had off, I took her tied on the same fly and she caught a huge fish. So I called my uncle who loves to fish and now lives in Arizona where he doesn't get to do much. And I said, whatever reason, 2018 is a big fish year. You've got to get up here. So he got on a plane, flew up. I put on this Christmas tree ornament at like eight o'clock in the morning and we float until noon without touching a fish. And he said, all right, I'm not fishing this thing anymore. I'm cutting it off. I'm either putting on a dry fly or a black woolly bugger. And we were meeting my dad at a a boat ramp about noon and he was going to jump in and join us for the afternoon. So dad gets in and he said, well, I'm not going to fish that and I'm not going to fish a woolly bugger. I want to fish a dry fly. So I'll row until we get to some flatter water. Wade, why don't you get in the back and fish and I'll row. So I tie on my Christmas tree ornament and flip it out there. And about 20 minutes in, I tag the probably the most gorgeous fish I've ever caught. It was a 22 inch hen, but she was so, you know, colored up with gorgeous, gorgeous spring colors and, and just fat. I mean, she was a beautiful fish. So they said, all right, you get on the oars, give me that thing. And, uh, again, went hours without touching anything with that fly and put on a dry fly, caught fish, put on a black woolly bugger, caught fish. So the next day, same thing. My uncle's like, all right, I'll try it again. Nothing. So dad gets on the oars at lunch. We come around a corner. I'm fishing. Now it's taken about an hour before I've touched a fish. So it's it's not like this thing's gangbusters or I was doing something differently. But I put a long cast to the right bank and dad said, let's go left. This is a good little soft inside bend. I said, well, wait a minute. I've got a good drift going. He said, no, let's go left. So he pulls the boat to the left and it dragged my streamer out in such a way that it it turned and came to the surface and all of us watched the take. Huh. I mean, the whole eddy turned orange and this massive hen took the fly and came zipping right out to the boat and were able to fight her with the boat. If she'd gone upstream, I never would have landed her. And we got her against the boat. My uncle reached out with a net and stuck it up under the head of the fish. And I said, don't you dare lift. She's way too big for that net. And, you know, you're going to knock her off the hook. So we kind of corralled her. Dad got the boat into the eddy and I jumped out and essentially had to tail her like a steelhead mm -hmm. and we put a tape on her at no one spoke. We got the tape measure out and taped the fish and I quickly lifted her for a photo and we set it back in and dad said, wait a minute, tape that again. And I pulled the tape over it. My uncle held the front on the nose and we pulled the tail to the back and it was 29 and three quarters. Mm. And he said, well, she's not quite 30 inches. Let her go. <laughs> and he didn't mean like he wasn't demeaning the fish in any way. He was just matter of fact, it was 29 and three quarters. Now get that beautiful thing back in the water. Yeah. And, uh, I looked up at him and, you know, I think every fish we catch a dear client of ours, put it this way, every fish we catch, we're looking over our shoulder into a memory bank of whoever taught us to fish to say, look, I got one. And here I'm looking up at my dad who taught me to fish on this river. And neither of us have ever seen a fish like this. And I said, Oh my gosh, dad. And he said, well, enjoy this moment. You'll never catch another one like that. <laughs> and I won't. That's crazy. But I'll never forget that one. So yeah, yes, there are 29 to 32 inch brown trout in that river, but I've never seen one until that moment. And I'll, I'll likely never see one again. But the fact that that fishery can support that fish is so cool. Right. That is cool. And these aren't fish that are necessarily migrating um down to like a lake or something like that these are just fish that are sitting there in the river eating other fish pretty much exactly there's no lake supporting the size of fish although they do move a lot they've done some telemetry studies and tagged fish down in the jefferson river that have traveled up to 100 miles so they move around quite a bit but the biologist said this fish that i caught uh, was likely a sterile female 
Hmm. And the reason she got that big and stayed that healthy was she didn't have to beat herself up during spawning season. Oh, right. And her purpose was to eat. Exactly. Just that's all she did was eat. <laughs> She's, well, how many pounds? So you talk 30 inches, because if you think of a, you know, like a, it depends on the species, like that's probably fatter than your normal, what would you guess on poundage? I think we settled on 11. Yeah, 11 pounds. I was going to say, because typically a 30 inch fish is like a, for at least with a steelhead, you roughly say 30 is 10 pounds. So every pound above, every inch above 30 is another pound. Yeah. Yeah. So a little thicker. Yeah. And she was eating baby grayling and baby whitefish and brook trout and, she was a healthy girl. Yeah, that's really cool. My dad was as similar as yours. You know, he kind of taught me everything. And um, he's at this point now where he's old enough where he doesn't really fish anymore. You know what I mean? Like, it's kind of a struggle. I've talked a little bit about this, but do you see your dad? I mean, are you seeing those changes where, you know, he's kind of not getting out as much? What's that transition? How has that been for you? I would say he's getting out more oh, good. now, but he's doing it so much differently and I think, you know, as so many fishers go through a trajectory of when you start out, you want to catch a fish and then you want to catch a lot of fish and then you want to catch a big fish and then you want to catch a big fish on a dry fly. Then you want to get a really big fish on a streamer. And then you kind of go back to, you know, not really wanting to fish. You want to teach. And dad, at this stage of his career, the guys at Sweetgrass, uh, the bamboo rod makers from Winston um, fame, they built him a bamboo walking stick oh cool and he's got his walking stick and his bamboo fly rod that glenn brackett built him and a 14 foot leader and a little teeny soft tackle that he's tied uh or a little dry fly that he's tied and he'll hike in uh our lab just passed away and now he's got a german short hair pointer so he'll hike into an area and if the fish aren't rising or he doesn't see a good fish rising He'll turn around and walk back. <laughs> nice. Without ever taking the fly off the rod. So the style of his fishing has really changed. But I think now, as much as anything, he's out there to try and see what's going on. You know, our rivers are changing, as you mentioned, climate change. Yeah. There's so much talk in the news and so much chatter on social media. So I think he's out there every day more to have his finger directly on the pulse of what's going on on the Big Hole River. Is the big hole the one, I mean, I guess that's where your lodge is. It sounds like that's the one you really, you know, um, maybe spend more time on. How is that different than the other few rivers you guys fish? Yeah. So in a, in a five day itinerary, we want to show you at least two days on the big hole because it's really three different rivers in its topography and the way it fishes and it's limited by historical use. So my dad has a certain number of days on his outfitter license uh, for each client. So you couldn't come and fish five days on the big hole. Mm, gotcha. That helps keep crowding down. So we like to show you one day on the beaver head, uh, one day on the bitter root, maybe a day on the Jefferson, if there's a good hatch, uh, maybe a day on the Clark fork, if there's a good hatch. And then some days we'll go out as far as the Missouri, you know, if trichos are going on or, or the caddis hatch is really on fire, we'll, we'll go out that far. We have two captains for the Land of the Giants section of the Missouri River, which can be a blast. But yeah, the big hole is the home water. Although we sit on the Wise River, which is a national forest permit that we actually don't have. I don't know of anyone that has it, but you can't guide on the Wise River. So that really keeps crowding down. But what you can do on day of arrival or day of departure or any day after your guide trip is walk out of our lodge uh, onto national forest and fish until your heart's content. Oh, that's awesome. So your home water is, uh, you do have a little cool walkable, yeah, home water right out of the back door. We do. We're on the Wise River. Today's episode is sponsored by Country Financial. The fires in the Northwest and throughout the West and in the last few years have been devastating for thousands of people. Uh, those folks, some folks have lost their homes, their belongings, uh, and their sense of safety has all been challenged. This is why insurance and protecting your assets are so critical. Dalton at Country Financial is here, and he was on the front lines during the fires, handing out checks to Country Financial community members, providing drinks, food, and more. And each time Dalton meets up with a client, he does an extensive review of their current assets and coverage. This is his opportunity to really 
decide and let you know what you need uh, to make educated decisions for your insurance needs. This is a super critical piece, and Dalton Roy Roy loves it. He loves getting out in the rural community, connecting with people, loves the outdoors, fishing, hunting, everything that goes with it. And so I'm excited to be sharing uh, Country Financial and Dalton with you. The unexpected will happen, so it's always best to make sure your assets and life are protected. You can head over to wetflyswing.com slash country right now to get started. That's C-O-U-N-T-R-Y. Check out Dalton and support this podcast in a great local company right now. Have you guys over the years, you know, with the eight slots, have you guys thought about, you know, like doubling that or just adding more lodges to, or do you kind of feel like you're in a sweet spot with your lodge? I do feel that we're, we're in a niche and it's like the lottery system. It comes up quite a bit at the dinner table with, you know, our clientele, none of them are underachievers in their business endeavors or their course of life. They've figured out some pretty tough problems. And I had an interesting conversation on the river one day with a client who was convinced that Big Hole Lodge needs to grow (laughs) or die. Oh, wow. You know, just like a company, it has to continue to grow and either become profitable to sell or, you know, take over in a way the other lodges in the area. And I said, hmm, I think that model is the norm. You know, there are some very big investor owned lodges cropping up throughout the West. And that's not our niche. Dad started this and he's still here hosting and now I'm running it. And I hope my son or daughter run it one day and we're there every night and we're there at at coffee in the morning and out at the fly shop. And it's it's very hands-on. And to do that, and sustain that, it's got to stay small. Not to mention, I don't think the rivers can handle more crowding. I don't think they can handle eight boats out of Big Hole Lodge. Just like we've been saying. No, I think that's cool. I love that. You know, we can spread that out among five rivers and kind of reduce our, our impact, hopefully, and stay in business because it's, you know, it's a labor of love and it's really a crazy business to be in, like ranching. Right. It's so much work and overhead and hands-on and you're really dependent. You're at the mercy of nature. Right. And the legislature. Yeah. Which is probably a topic for an entirely yeah. <laughs> different podcast, but stream access is on the chopping block for this upcoming legislative session. That is the thing that really makes Montana so unique is that it has this amazing law, right? Like if you're the public and it allows for private property, right? Walking along any private property as long as you're in the water, right? Up to the high water. Exactly. So Clayton Elliott works for Trout Unlimited locally, and I've worked with him at Upper Missouri Waterkeeper, uh, the organization where where I'm the program director. And um, I'm going to have him in my YouTube channel for a similar type podcast, which I'll forward your way and maybe you could share with your audience. Oh, for sure. But he's going up, he's moving up to Helena for the session, uh, basically to speak on Trout Unlimited's behalf, but then also monitor all these bills that are coming at stream access. And the idea being, you know, right now we have a very liberal high watermark to high watermark public trust doctrine law, and we don't have the water to really fill that up as much through the year. So there's a lot of public land, which is fabulous for fly fishing. Um, But to attract some big dollar new ranch owners as some of these single family ranches sell off because there's not a next generation to take over. It's better if you can say I'm buying a ranch that no one else can access, you know, in some people's eyes. So gotcha. it'll be an interesting session. Right. Wow. And we're going to keep pretty close eye on it because that type of thing would, you know, potentially put fly fishing lodges like ours that rely on, on public access to public waterways out of business. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah just from the outside thought it was kind of, yeah, kind of set in stone. Like, and I've heard people even say that about the Montana law, like, well, it's there, you know, and like Colorado, you could look at that where that's a different story where there was a lot of money and they didn't get that protection, but it sounds like it's not guaranteed. Yeah. That could change. You could literally, that law can change and then it could be just the public access is gone in in an instant. Well, it'll come down. I mean, I don't know where the Supreme court would come down on this, but the idea of navigability you know, to me, it's a commerce clause argument. If these waterways were ever used to move currency, and in my mind, you know, floating a log down to the next logging jam was moving currency, 
And that, that's a navigable stream that ought to be accessed by anyone in the United States, anyone in the world who's in the United States. So, But states like Utah and Wyoming and Colorado and New Mexico most recently, they've all grappled with this idea and come down different ways. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that'll have to be for another one. Yeah. <laughs> let's uh, let, let's circle back around. I want to hit on the big hole uh, here because then we talked a little about dry flies. We talked a little bit about streamers, but again, take us back to the big hole. So that's a river that you know there's hatches throughout the year. It sounds like summertime. You eventually get to a point where it warms up and you got some a lot more terrestrials. What is your you know throughout the year? What are the hatches that really get you excited when you think of the big hole? Mother's Day caddis hatch to start things off is pretty spectacular if you can hit it right. And the only way you'd hit it wrong is if we got a bunch of rain and colored the river up. Um, but when it's clear water and that big size 10 caddis is flying around, that's wild. And then you go through streamer season and then beginning of June, you start getting the, the big bugs walking around, crawling in the willows. So our salmon fly hatch draws the big crowd and you'll see people follow it. You know, it hits the Henry's Fork and then it comes up and uh, you see it on Rock Creek and the Bitterroot and then the Big Hole and then the Madison. So, you know, we always tongue in cheek say somebody get on social media and post that the hatches started on the Madison. Get these boats out of here. <laughs> yeah. You can't move kind of across the state on that salmon fly corridor and chase those. Oh, wow. How does it move? It's a temperature thing, right? With the salmon fly. But how is it moving across all those rivers you just talked about? From west toward the east. Mm. Yeah. So someone will correct me in the comments because I never fish it down in Idaho, but I think it starts south of us. And then you'll see it on the western side of Montana um, and Idaho, and then coming across and then finishes on the Yellowstone. Gotcha. But my favorite hatch is right after that, the Yellow Sallies. They're much, much easier for the fish to get their mouth around You'll notice as the hatch draws on, the fish aren't eating the salmon fly anymore. They're slapping it like a dolphin, you know, killing a, or like a, an orca killing a seal. They, they come up and tail whack it to get it underwater. So those wings get wet and stick to the side of the bug. And then the fish can eat it without getting wing on the outside of his mouth. Oh, wow. And that drives you nuts as a dry fly fisher, because you're setting the hook you almost have to let the fish take the fly underwater and then eat it and then set the hook, which, you know, you might get that right one out of 10. Huh. So my favorite is right after that, throw in the little bugs and it's something a gorged fish could still consider and uh, easier to throw, easier for them to eat. And then it, it lasts longer. We have that yellow Sally through the month of June into July. And then we get our mayflies and, you know, July is just spectacular with number of the diversity of bugs out. And then we kind of go into a lull uh, right at the end of July. And then the beginning of August, we, a lull in, in hatches, that is, you, fishing is still good. Um, it's just, you're going to more attractor patterns and dropping a little trailing nymph under a dry uh, during the, the middle of the day. And then you get into trichos. And I would say trichos you know, getting out of the boat and watching a cloud of trichos above the water. And then as they hit the water about 11 a.m. and every fish in the river is up until 1 p.m. and you're literally head hunting with a five weight and a long leader standing behind the fish saying, no, no, not that one, not that one. Oh, look at that one. Oh, wow. Roy, so you see a fish rise and then you see a big one and go try to hit it. Well, you see like 30 fish rising all within a cast reach and you've got to pick the head you want and then try and get that fly down to where another fish isn't going to eat it <laughs> oh man that's a blast and what is the trico remind us again what is the trico in the um you know kind of the biology of the bugs what order of species is it it's the smallest mayfly little teeny size 18 to 22 black bodied white winged um so there are duns as they come up out of the riffles they look like little sailboats and then they come up and they mate and then they come down on a spinner fall. The females come down to lay their eggs and they splay their wings out on the water. So you're using, you know, really tiny, hard to see flies and trusting your cast and then setting the hook to what you think might be where your fly was if you can't see it. It's just a much more in tune style of dry fly fishing, which I love. And then in the afternoon, you've got terrestrials out. Yeah, the, right. the day heats up and the grasshoppers, 
have to get near the water for a drink and the ants and the beetles and and then we're watching water temps of course so afternoon that time of year our lodge policy is 67 degrees we reel up and head for a beer perfect that's a great thing so poppers and then as you turn the corner towards the fall what does that start does the temperature eventually start cooling down a little bit and you kind of still have some hatches going on there yeah trichos hang on well into september so that trico terrestrial is august and september and then as you crawl later into september on a dark day cloudy day you'll get blue winged olives mm. a sunny day you'll get um mahogany duns and uh also very fun is you know, mid to late September, brown trout don't really start spawning till about mid-October, but they'll start getting aggressive, just like, you know, deer before a rut. The males show up and they start kind of claiming ground and hmm. they're nowhere near spawning yet, but they're starting to think about it. And if you throw on a little unweighted zonker and strip it fast right at the surface of the water, it's like dry fly fishing almost or... Oh, wow. I was just red fishing down in Louisiana doing the same type of thing, stripping an unweighted flashy thing right at the surface. And you make eye contact with these fish before they eat. Jeez. So you got, <laughs> and these browns are coming up throughout the year. Is it a mix? I mean, are you able to really target the browns on the dries throughout the season, throughout the summer? No, it's definitely a mixed bag. I mean, when they're up feeding, you can see the difference. You can see the reddish hue and pick out a brown, but we have some gorgeous rainbows too big, big rainbows and they're feisty fighters. So they've got more of a black rounded head when you see them rising and browns, of course, have that, you know, green head and yellow orangey side. Often you'll see their tail and then you could catch a grayling or a brook trout or a, a rainbow or a brown or the cutthroat are very elusive. They don't seem to be doing as well with these warmer summers. Um, whitefish are pretty easy to spot. Their mouths are downturned. So to eat a dry fly, they have to come up pretty vertical and they throw a little column of water as they eat. Yeah. And then your fly box, what does that look like? A mess. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm getting better at spending my winter organizing it. <laughs> but yeah. I used to have the great big briefcase and that's, you can't. So one of our guides showed me the way he's got these little flat single layer open face window type plexiglass window to look in. And he's got, you know, a mayfly box and his attractor box and his hopper box and his nymph box. And you can stick one of those in a, a waders or in the back of your wading shorts. And I've gotten much better about building a day box. And I actually give my clients when we're waiting, I give them their own day box and it's got oh, you do? Oh, cool. anything that they might encounter. So here's, if you feel like an ant, here's, if you see a mayfly here's a little nymph if things are not working and then i carry the bigger bigger war chest but our lodge policy on flies is we get all our flies from montana fly company and the guides get their own fly box at the beginning of the year and fill it with whatever they think they might encounter and so you're never you know you're never doing the hank patterson oh i wish we had a caddis yep but uh <laughs> That's awesome. So the clients can bring their own flies and often do, and we love to shop out of their boxes. And sometimes that's the ticket is an ant that no one's ever seen, but no need to bring your own the guide has everything. Oh, gotcha. But if you did want to get, you know, maybe you were a big fly tire and you wanted to tie up some of your own stuff, probably like that hatch chart. We'll put that in the show notes too. Grab that, your dad's hatch chart and have a little shot of what that looks like. Cause somebody could probably say, well, if I'm coming up there in July, I definitely want to have some pale morning duns and exactly caddis and PMDs. Yeah. And yellow sallies. Yep. Gotcha. Where would you send somebody if they were, you know, wanting to get out here, maybe head into that neck of the woods and, you know, maybe they're not coming into your lodge, but they're just going to fish it as far as resources and kind of taking this conversation further. Is there, um, I mean, I know there's some fly shops. What would you recommend? Well, always feel free to call us. Okay. Dad and I are, one of us is always available and I'm happy to, you know, discuss what's going on and where I would go, whether you're a client or not. Uh, Great Divide Fly Shop is right when you come off the freeway, when you first encounter the big hole. And Craig and Leah Jones are fantastic. They've got a great fly selection and a great finger on the pulse of what's going on and where they would go. They also do day trips. If you're not committed to a full six night, five day, uh, they can likely get you on the water on shorter notice. Yeah, cool. All right. Well, that's a great resource. But yeah, I, I would kind of target 
Well, like I say, the big hole's three different rivers. So you either target the lower Twin Bridges area. And if you're down there, call Mike Geary at Healing Waters Lodge. And if you're up kind of in our neck of the woods, either call me or Great Divide Outfitters. And then as you get up to the upper river, it gets pretty skinny up there and you really need to watch water temperatures. But there's not a fly shop up in, well, the Hook and Horn is a fly shop up in Wisdom. I like that. They'd have their finger on the pulse of what's going on up in the upper river. Perfect. And you guys are, I think, was it 2017, 2018, you were uh, Orvis and Dorse Lodge of the Year or something like that? Was that the case? We were. Yeah. Talk about that. What does it take to become, you know, basically Lodge of the Year, right? What does that take? Well, it was a huge honor. Orvis has been a great partner for us for many, many years now. I don't know how many, but I want to say 15. And Orvis vets lodges and fly shops and guides individually. And, you know, they're pretty particular and they, they call all the background checks, call clients, call other businesses in the area and, and get a real picture. And then they come out and there are requirements, you know, no plastic water bottles in the lunches and definite commitment to conservation. And it really comes down to client feedback, a level of long-term buy-in from the client. And we've been so lucky with our staff. Our chef has been with us 29 years. Oh, wow. And she's absolutely unbelievable. Amazing. Our guide staff too. We've got a great group of guides. And then our clients. I mean, that's the best part of this whole business is the people that we get to encounter. And Nick Evans, you know, 30 something years with us and Ed and Patty Kramer, 28 years with us. And, wow, you know, so many clients I could name that just keep coming back. And, and that's really what I love about this business. They've seen me in diapers. So, you know, they're family now. That's right. That's right. And you've got the next generation coming. It sounds like behind you. Do you kind of fall more back on how your dad did it? Or sometimes you find spots where, well, we could tweak this and do it a little bit differently than how dad did it. I mean, he's got a winning formula. I try not to deviate too far. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. There are some things, you know, for example, we used to spend a lot of time trying to get into magazines and podcasts and, and YouTube videos are reaching a clientele that we're going to need to survive. Yep, definitely. No, on the whole, I may be forwardly running the show, but I'm I'm asking a lot of questions and trying to do it as he did, both in running the business and in fishing the water. <laughs> Yeah, that's a smart move for sure, since you guys have been going strong for a while. Well, I got a, just a couple of, at least one random one, as I get, you mentioned Harrison Ford at the start. I'm, I'm just curious on, uh, I always like to throw in a couple of random uh, questions here at the end, but as far as movies, Harrison Ford got me thinking, any movies popped to your head that, you know, were like your favorites or something Harrison was in? Oh, Indiana Jones, and I heard he's remaking, actually. Or, oh, are you serious? Or doing a sequel right now. They're using some sort of de-aging CGI to get him back. Oh, nice. Oh, I love that. Oh, Indiana Jones. That's one of the best. Yeah. yeah. And Star Wars. I mean, a lot of my peers and friends have seen him around town and I guess he's super friendly and, and nice and fitting in well to the Butte community while he's doing this cowboy show. But yeah, that's a great one. And I look forward to, you know, I don't know about the whole soap opera storyline to Yellowstone, but I look forward to seeing some of the cinematography and the places that the road's been closed down on the way to the guide trip because they've got somebody out on horseback fly fishing. I've never done it that way, but I'll have to check it out. <laughs> yeah. Well, don't you guys have like a little bit of a, um, a horseback opera? Like people can, I think I saw that on your site, right? They can take trips in by horseback. Yeah, we do. We do. We've got mountain lakes. That's a good thing uh, to talk about because I think as rivers get warm in August, there are great ways to alleviate pressure on those fish by getting up in the mountains where the water's cold and the fish are beautiful. So we offer a day trip via horseback up to lakes in the Pioneer Mountains. And this past year, we partnered with a, a fella out of Bozeman who's been doing llama trips in the Bozeman Yellowstone Gallatin corridors. And he's kind of getting away and moving over our way, but he has like 40 llamas. And for those that like to hike instead of ride, the llama can carry all the gear and you go on a nice hike and then and fish and he'll actually do overnights with those. And I think in his business, he's got some elk hunting that the llamas assist with, which I am very envious of when you put an elk down and have to carry it out in four pieces. It'd be great to throw that on a llama. <laughs> yeah, right on. 
Nice. Well, we'll put um, links out to uh, everything you guys have going. I guess bigholelodge.com is the best place to uh, send everybody today. Correct. Perfect. All right, Wade. Well, uh, we'll definitely keep in touch with you here. Thanks for uh, taking us into your part of the region. And it's, uh, you know, it's a popular one, so it's good to get your perspective. And we'll definitely keep in touch with you uh, moving ahead. And hopefully I can swing by and maybe we can get out there on the water sometime. Well, thanks so much for having me on. And yes, please do look us up when you're in this neck of the woods. We'll definitely get on the water. So there it is. We are cruising through Montana with a quick stop at uh, Wade's operation. You can check out all the show notes today, wetflyswing.com slash 398. 398. That's the good stuff. We're going to give a shout out here in a second to what we have coming up next. But I did want to give a listener shout out. Jay Park uh, has been an active member of the Swing Member Society. This is where we have some folks over there helping support this podcast. And Jay, I want to give a big shout out to you. It's been great. I've appreciated the support and all the feedback from you over the years and excited to dig into another year in 2023. It's going to be a big one. So excited to have you on and great uh, that you're still connected with us in the members group. You can connect with me anytime there or by sending me an email, dave at wetflyswing.com. We'd love to hear from you. If you're a new listener or an old listener um, and you haven't connected with me recently, you can do that right now. It's the best way I know of to keep connected with you and produce content that you're going to love. If you get a chance, please send me an email or connect with me online, uh, social media, anywhere there would be great. All right. So where are we headed next? We have a big finale coming up here to the end of this season. In two days, we got Jeff Liske. We're doing the Steelhead School wrap up. And this is going to be a summary and some more tips on steelhead fishing with the focus on Steelhead Alley. And we just talked about the trip. We got a cool little end of the show there with our campfire chat, our fireside chat with Dave. Uh, we recorded some of the amazing guests we had out there. So that's coming up on Thursday. And next week, we're turning the corner to 400 episodes. The big 400 is next week on Tuesday. And we got a pretty special episode for you. It is not going to be the typical episode. It's definitely one that's pretty emotional, pretty powerful. So I hope you get a chance to listen in on that episode next Tuesday. And then we're jumping right into our traveled program, The Road Less Traveled. We got some good stuff going here. So all year we're going to be doubling down on a couple things, more content for you, uh, more events for you. We're doing more of these giveaways. We're doing more of these in-person events. So if you have an idea of where you want to go, If you'd like to connect with us, connect with some of our guests, we're putting together some of the past guests we've had on, some of the best and biggest, uh, you know, most influential people out there that really know how to do it, just like Jeff Liske, which was pretty, pretty amazing to put that together. So I'm excited for 2023. We got a big crew of support. We got some, uh, some new positions on with the podcast and, uh, and that's supporting us. Big shout out to a couple of our new folks out there that are going to be coming in. I'm going to be talking more about this as we go. And we announce some of the new things we have going. But I just want to say thank you, personally, you listening right now, because this is why we're doing it. We're doing it because of you. And I want to hear from you to learn how we can make it better. All right. Have a good day. I hope to connect with you very soon. So I hope you're having a good afternoon, a good evening, or good morning, wherever you are in the world. And I look forward to connecting with you on the next episode. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.